Okay, hello everybody. We are live again. Uh, welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I'm here with my friend, Dr. Carrie Jones, who I'll introduce in just a moment. We're going to be talking everything hormones today, one of my favorite topics, and I know Dr. Jones as well. If you've missed any previous episodes, you can find all of them on my YouTube channel or on iTunes or Stitcher or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Um, please do stop in, leave a review, um, rate us so that we can uh, reach more people. Now, I want to introduce my guest. Dr. Carrie Jones is an internationally recognized speaker, consultant, and educator on the topic of women's health and hormones over 20 years in the industry. Dr. Jones graduated from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, where she also completed a two-year residency in women's health, hormones, and endocrinology. Later, she graduated with a Master of Public Health program. Dr. Jones is one of the first to become board certified through the American Board of Naturopathic Endocrinology and currently serves on the board. She was the medical director of Dutch for several years, one of my favorite tests for hormones. We'll talk a little bit about that today. And is a clinical expert for the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center and Under Armour. Currently, she's the head of medical education at Rupa Health and the host of Root Cause Medicine Podcast. So welcome, Dr. Carey. I'm so glad to have you here. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me on. I always love talking with you. I know we have so much fun. Um, I love to start story. And so I'd love to know, like, how did you get interested in medicine? Was it something you always knew you wanted to do? What was your path to becoming a naturopathic doctor? It, it is something I've always known I wanted to do since I was a little girl. I knew I wanted to be a doctor. I thought I would become an OBGYN or maybe a pediatrician. And I really sort of got into that sort of women's health love and hormones love because I don't know about you, but I got health education, sex education, um, from my football coach. So I grew up in the South and because they were short teachers, a lot of teachers did cross duty on what they taught. And we learned all about health from a Southern football coach. And it was not great. We did not learn a lot as you can probably imagine. And moving forward into college, I decided, um, as I was getting ready and prepping and taking all the classes and volunteering for, to go to medical school, I was working with a hospital that did a lot of community outreach. And I thought, man, I really love the outreach aspect, the education aspect, as opposed to the very, um, you know, stark, harsh clinical surgery, which is very important, very needed. I'm not against it at all. It just wasn't lighting me up. I moved to the West Coast from the Midwest and I found naturopathic medicine and I just kept going in the direction of women's health hormones in particular, because I find that a lot of my friends and family and colleagues and now in patients were like, gosh, I didn't care. I didn't know that. Like, I didn't know that's what happened with my menstrual cycle. You know, I didn't know that's what happened when you move into perimenopause. I didn't know that's what happens in menopause. Um, and because of there were so many, I didn't know, I didn't know, nobody taught me. I just kept going and in, in that direction to really shine a light on that area to educate for people. You know, it's sad, isn't it? Because um, even in this uh, decade, like we should know about hormones, we should know about sexual yeah. health, we should know about women's yeah. health as we age and through our different phases of life. And still, and even I'm like you, I went to medical school, trained in all this stuff. And even there, some of the really practical kind of stuff, I mean, yeah, we know metabolic pathways, we know biochemistry, right? But some of the practical things like, what do you do menopause vaginal dryness? Or what do you do? Yeah. Um, unless it's a pharmaceutically sponsored kind of thing, we are not taught the ins and outs and the details that we as women need to know. And, and we, as doctors need to pass on now, again, you and I now have become hormone experts. So <laughs> we can talk that for sure. We'll go deep today, but I love that you're talking about this because I bet even here, what from our listeners, and if you're listening, write in questions, because we want to go deep and we want to talk about those things you care about. You probably have questions. You either haven't got a good answer from your doctor, or maybe you're wondering, you're afraid to ask. And this is so common, right? And if we look at like the historical studies, it was all men and it was all like so much was predominantly male and we are very different hormonally and, and that. So, so, so important. Um, one of the little tidbit is at 25, I went through breast cancer. So I learned again, a lot about hormones. Maybe let's start there. Um, yeah. That frames the detox pathway so well, because if I look back at my history, why would a 25 year old get cancer yeah. and a hormone related cancer? Two things I'd love to start with is what are endocrine disruptors? Because I feel like <laughs> that's a piece of the puzzle, right? And then we'll go on to like, why would someone maybe have trouble with detox at a young age or so endocrine disruptors, let's just start Endo there. Endocrine disruptors are chemicals um, that look like and act like our endocrine system. So our endocrine system are, is our hormone system. Think of like our estrogens, our progesterone, testosterone, 
thyroid, et cetera. So when we talk about endocrine disruptors, that chemicals that literally come in, look like our hormone and dis hormones and disrupt that system. Now that system is uh, delicate. <laughs> that, that system does not want to be disrupted. And that system has a fine um, pattern that it follows or rhythm that it follows most of the time. And so if you are exposed to endocrine disruptors, you're going to literally disrupt that rhythm. You're going to disrupt the production of those hormones. Uh, and, and you're just going to cause a lot of the symptoms that you're likely having. And so interesting to me, having worked for a lab company for a long time, we would see people with completely normal levels of estrogen, estradiol, let's say on, on lab work. And they would say, but I have all the symptoms. I'm so estrogenic. Come to find out they were really exposed to all these chemicals. And these chemicals don't show up on traditional laboratory testing. They look similar to estrogen, but not enough to show up positively on a lab test or to, to, to skew or to to elevate a lab test. And so then it can be really disheartening because maybe you go see your OBGYN or your practitioner who's not hormonally skilled and they go, nope, everything's fine. You look fine. And you're like, no, but I'm have horrible heavy periods and I have terrible PMS or I'm growing fibroids or polyps and, or breast cancer. And, um, like, where did this come from? And in knowing that these chemicals can play a major role is a huge one. Yeah. So thanks for framing that. And because like you said, it can be very confusing. Let's talk, what, what is estrogen dominance? Because what you're describing is yeah. kind of estrogenic, estrogen dominance. Mm -hmm. How might a young woman, a, you know, middle-aged woman or different women, different ages know? Tell us a little bit about what does that look like for people yeah. with estrogen dominance? So we, estrogen dominance or estrogen excess, we've shortened a big, long phrase down to two words, estrogen excess, estrogen dominance. What we mean is, Usually in a cycling woman, so if you get your period after ovulation in that second half of your cycle called the luteal phase, you have not enough progesterone or too much estrogen compared to where you should. So it's a, that's a very long sentence. And what we've done is shrunk it way down to go, well, you're estrogen dominant. Right. You're in, Unless you have zero progesterone, you're not actually dominant in estrogen. In that phase of your cycle, you really should be making boatloads of progesterone, mm -hmm. milligrams worth of progesterone. But what can happen is it, it's kept in a careful ratio with estrogen, with estradiol. And if you don't make those boatloads of progesterone, or you're, you've got an excessive amount of estradiol for whatever reason, there are a few, then you get your uh, ratio is tipped in the direction of estrogen and you feel it. And that's when you feel those, again, PMS, heavy periods, bloating, maybe acne, fibroids, polyps, et cetera, et cetera, in the cycling women. woman. Now, as we move, as we get older, and as we hit our perimenopausal age, um, what happens is we lose the ability to ovulate or release that egg either regularly or with a lot of um, oomph behind it. And when we can't do that, then we don't make a lot of progesterone. So by default, us perimenopausal women now become we feel just more estrogenic in our everyday life. And the other interesting thing about perimenopause that is not a great design flaw is that our estrogens levels kind of, instead of being on a nice healthy rhythm or a, what I call like a controlled roller coaster, it's like an off the wall roller coaster. Like estrogen's high, estrogen's low, estrogen's high again, estrogen's over there, estrogen's over there. And people feel that, you know, we have women in our forties who come in or the early fifties and they're like, what happened to me? I have gone off the rails. I'm like, yeah. you literally, your estrogen has gone off the rails. It is yeah. all over the place. But regardless, because your estrogen's all over the place and progesterone is generally on the low end, you again get that estrogen dominant, estrogen excess type symptom. Well, thank you for explaining. And uh, for those of you who are listening to audio only, we're doing these hands yeah. with our, with our <laughs> the roller coaster because roller we know and we've been there and all of that. Um, like I said, thanks for explaining. And just as a side note, Carrie, one of my favorite things about you is your sense of humor. And it comes across so good, like on Instagram and stuff. I love, I'm like, I just love her. And did I hear you, Gemini? Heck yeah, I'm a Gemini. Yeah. High five. <laughs> <laughs> this is like this quirky, like I I, I saw that. I'm like, I, I I love that sense of humor. Yeah. So by the way, if you haven't followed Carrie on Instagram, please do. She's hysterical. <laughs> love, love, love your humor. Cause it's a lot about love hormones it. and about the slickness. Yep. Yeah. And if you're women listening or men and you have a woman in your life, uh, you know this, you know, so you mentioned like cystic breasts and fibroids and endometriosis and then yeah. heavy painful periods and PMS and what woman at some point in their life hasn't had those things. And it is. And the sad thing is kind of what you alluded to earlier is because our world is becoming more toxic. This is the norm instead of the exception. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, um, unfortunately. So 
So what do people do? Like, say they, you know, maybe don't have a doc like you or I, or they do, or where would we start with like, first of all, just, we talked about symptoms a little bit. Is there anything mm-hmm. else symptom wise and then testing? What do we do to figure out what's going on? Well, first of all, what I know what I tell people is to read your book, <laughs> read your book so they're now educated <laughs> on these chemicals and the idea behind this and then what the body is really capable of and what you can do because you outline that so well. Um, but the second thing too is if you what I don't like and I'm trying to combat against are when you go to your doctor, let's say your general practitioner, your primary care, your OBGYN, and they go, Well, that's that's normal. It's normal for you to have super heavy periods. Like that's normal for your, for your breast to be tender. Like, well, common and normal are not the same thing. Mm-hmm. Common is accepted, but not acceptable. Right. Normal is different. So no, it is not. And then the second, the third thing I say is that it's doesn't your primary care, your GP or what have you. And, and you alluded to this in your book too, mm-hmm. may not have a lot of a hormone background. And so it may be time for you to branch out and find somebody who actually really understands hormones at, at a deep level, instead of just blowing you off and saying, no, oh, no, no, you're, you know, that's, that's totally common or that's totally normal of somebody quote your age. Um, when really you need a practitioner, who's going to really work you up and figure out your hormones. Now, if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't even know where to start. I, 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 my appointment, let's say it's a two week wait or a two month wait, or what can I do in the meantime? Like the biggest things you can do, there's twofold. One is, um, get your body eliminating. So detoxification, but eliminate what you can. That's filling up your bucket. So like in your book, you talk about the bucket analogy where you've got this bucket and it gets filled up with life and toxins and chemicals and stress and et cetera, et cetera. And if it gets too full and you aren't able to empty it fast enough, it overflows. And when it overflows, you feel that in your body. And so if you can work really hard, if you can look around and think, all right, Carrie and Jill talked about these toxins, chemicals, like what am I putting in my skincare? What am I putting using for my makeup? What am I putting, um, what am I washing my sheets with? And my, my, what's my laundry detergent? What am I using to clean my house with? Is my house, because of course we're recording this at the holidays, is my house covered in scented candles and, you know, spice this and um, you do a fur that, and, you know, all the cherry this and all the holiday scents that are out right now. And we know, unfortunately, fragrance can be a real environmental or endocrine uh, disruptor for a lot of us. And so it's taking stock of what's in your home. It's taking stock of the water that you drink. Can you, can you look in your budget to maybe even just start with a basic water filter or maybe even a better water filter? You talk about air filters, you know, the air that you breathe. Um, I was uh, listening to um, uh, somebody earlier talking about mold and they were like, even just opening the window, like even just periodically opening the window and letting that air flow in and out um, for the house can make a world of difference if maybe an air filter doesn't fit in your budget. And so these things I have been working on, just like you, I've been working on this journey for decades. And so I remember a couple of years ago, I bought a brand, I bought a new mattress, but I bought a, you know, organic, all the things I, you know, I bought one of those mattresses that is healthy, whatever you want to call that, like an organic, healthy, all the things mattress. And I had many people in my comments say, Carrie, I can't afford a mattress. I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm in like chapter 24 of my book. You're in chapter one. You know, like when you run out of mascara, change your mascara. When you run out of deodorant, just switch to a, you know, a clean, look it up, clean deodorant. When you run out of detergent, like let's start a value, like go for one that's fragrance free as a start. And then, you know, these baby steps don't feel like you need to jump in and spend however much a mattress is. If that doesn't fit in your budget and you're not there yet, it's, it's these little tiny steps I've learned from you over time make a huge difference in our hormones. So that's like where you start today is we'll read your book, but second, start reading labels. And as you run out of things, replace them with um, better options that aren't going to fill up your toxic water in your bucket. Yeah. Carrie, I love that. And I love that you say, because I'll tell you, I had breast cancer 25, 26, 27. I was like, why did I get this? What happened? That was the start of my journey to clean health and living. Mm-hmm. And this is 20 years later. Yeah. And I remember the overwhelm. I'm a med- I was a medical student at the time. And like, I knew stuff. I knew how to find research. 
And just like you're saying, if you're listening and you're like, oh, this is overwhelming, please know we understand. Like, this is like, that's what I love that you say that because I remember being completely overwhelmed when I realized everything I put on my body was toxic. Yes, I know. <laughs> the cost of the replay, I mean, makeup, hair products, Safara, they, they get a portion of my money, right? I, like, <laughs> I didn't say that because there's better places. There's obviously like local, I like to get local and stuff too. But um, all that to say, we hear you. We know yeah. that it's a struggle. And I, it's 20 years in the making, both Carrie and I, at least for me, I'll, uh, at my age, and and it's been a long time. And so, um, what you're saying though is, and, and what I say in the book, clean air, clean water, clean food. We can start really simple and choosing, and even like dirty dozen on environmental working yes. groups. Choose use those foods that are most most likely um, sprayed with pesticides. Buy those organic, and then buy the other ones like a banana. You can peel non organic, so you can save money different places. Clean yeah. air, like you said, the very basic. Open your window. Open your window. Clean your filters in your furnace. That's not too expensive. Change those every three months and there's different things you can do like just buy a higher filter rating and granted those standalone air filters that we both love are great but they're expensive so start with those little things and clean water making sure you're not drinking out of plastic water bottles and I love that you mentioned fragrance because that's listed as a thing and it doesn't have to be named where it's from but if it's not from a natural source which it usually is not it's a phthalate and it's a definite endocrine disruptor so this is a big deal years ago I sprayed perfume on my skin right and I love perfume Oh my gosh. I Even now I, have, I still have a yeah. few fumes that, but you know what? Now, if I do wear it, it's on my clothing. It is not on my skin because that's an absorptive surface. So just want to encourage those listening because it is everywhere. And this is literally like why I get so passionate about this topic is because as breast cancer 25, that was my rude awakening to life and chemicals. And mm -hmm. I go into the farm chemicals. Some of those were such massively toxic things that were probably in my well water growing up. And then if I look back, I actually think that probably in utero, my mother probably had some of course. Toxicity. And then of course, of course, being born, I probably was born with some toxic load. So it's interesting. Um, Even now, speaking of, um, you know, farm chemicals, yeah. for those who are like, well, I didn't grow up on a farm, right? But you're eating the food that comes yeah. off of it. And if you live by it and the wind blows, yeah. you're, right, you're getting all that. And if you've ever walked into your local big box home shop in the spring, the amount of Roundup, like they had, I don't know how much Roundup pays for that, the display case yes. here where I live, but it, I thought, oh, we, oh, we're still doing this. We're still That's doing exactly this in 2022. Right? Me too, there was right? so, it was like, and the smell is enough to be like, oh, it's like, oh. it blows me away. I'm like, yes. I can't believe this is still here. It's like, yep. we were both in Vegas last year and I walked into the lobby, the casinos, of course, are still smoking. I'm like, oh, people still smoke indoors. I did, I think too, all the time. I know we went there. And every we time I know us. this, but I'm like, oh, really? Like, oh, that's right. I know. Oh, and I, right. I heard it's so many practitioners so who said, oh my gosh, I'm reacting. I'm reacting. Yeah. I, for, yeah. I forgot you can still smoke in the casinos. Now, obviously of course there's various, you know, various levels of casinos in the, where our, where our conferences yeah. that generally attracts people who don't smoke, yeah. but it doesn't mean nobody smokes. I mean, right. there's people smoking cigars and cigarettes. So as you walk through, you, you might really get hit, which then actually brings me to alcohol. I didn't even mention alcohol Talk about that. being a toxic for a lot of people. And I, I make this joke all the time that alcohol is a bully. Like she will push her front herself to the front of the line to get processed by your liver. And then the act of detoxifying alcohol, um, you know, creates a little toxin there and ruins estrogen. So now estrogen's pissed and she's going to go back and recirculate through your body. And we hear this now we're, I'm assuming probably predominantly a lot of your listeners are female. So, but it applies to men, it applies to everybody. Yes. Um, you know, but a lot of women are like, well, but I love my glass of wine. I have my glass of wine at night. I relax, you know, or I have a couple on the weekend. I relax. I'm like, all right, but then how do you feel? How do you feel the next day? How are your hormones? How much your, how's your PMS? Or the number of women who've said to me when I was, when I was younger, I'm 45. So when I was younger, I had all these women hit their forties and they would go, you just wait, you just wait. When you hit your forties, you right. can't drink alcohol anymore. I was like, what? That's crazy. Then I learned it's true. Your enzymes in your liver yeah. because of, of the changes in your hormones and menopause, like perimenopause, you know, really do slow down the way that you process alcohol. And so now I have so many perimenopausal people on social media and friends and colleagues and what have you that are like, it's so not worth it. I can't even do one glass. And in people will argue like, well, I only drink tequila, Carrie, because tequila doesn't affect my blood sugar. I'm like, that's great. Still alcohol. You know, yeah. I only drink the, you know, organic biodynamic, right. no added sugar wine. I'm like, that's fantastic. Wonderful. Still alcohol. So yeah. if you're having yeah. issues, yeah. If you've, you're like, gosh, I am a hormonal sort of train wreck when I'm listening to this, then maybe evaluate alcohol if that's a thing for you. 
I love that you're mentioning that because there's no, we're not condoning or, you know, saying there's anything wrong, but yet it is a choice I've chosen over the years since I breast cancer. Basically, I don't drink alcohol, yeah. but like one sip is my tolerance <laughs> and, and literally like just to have the taste like, oh, that was really good wine. And that's it. Yeah. And it's yeah. not, there's no judgment, but I have learned that I value my health so much in that detox. And let's talk a little bit about for people who don't understand, give us the very basic description of detox and this recirculation. So yeah. Can- so detoxification, but so is basically your, your exit plan. It's the way you, anything you eat or, or breathe or drink or swallow for the large part, like the, that's maybe not natural to your body or a chemical or a fragrance, or even a hormone that you make internally, you at one point have to get rid of it. They're not indefinite. Well, that's not true. Some chemicals unfortunately are, mm-hmm. but like, let's say your hormones, your hormones are not indefinite. So when you're done with an estrogen is an example, your body made it, it used it. Now it's like, okay, thanks for your time. It's time to retire, go away you process it. And when you process it, that's the act of detoxification. So it is a two, if not three-step process. The majority of the process happens in your liver. We love our liver. Thank you for our liver. And then we excrete it out of the bottom, our body. And so we go out the kidneys or we go out through the intestines when it comes to hormones. Now we have other excretion ways, the way we breathe, right? The way we sweat, um, but hormones particularly go out the kidneys or they go out the intestines. So if your liver is not doing well, if your liver, if you have fatty liver, um, if you are missing nutrients, maybe you have a lot of gut issues, you're not absorbing, the liver requires a lot of B vitamins, a lot of uh, minerals and stuff to help it do its job, then you're going to be a little slow, a little sluggish on the uptake genetically. Maybe you were born genetically with some not so great detoxification um, pathways. And so you're more prone to feeling bad in the fragrance aisle, right. Or worst case scenario, developing, going on to develop cancer at a young age. Um, or again, gut issues, gut you or kidney issues, right. And we're trying to excrete. Yeah. So if you have constipation, if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, if you're dealing with gas and bloating and all sorts of GI issues, this all messes up the way estrogen gets out. And if it can't get out, you can't eliminate it then the body recirculates it. It just pulls it right back in and goes, you know what? And let's, let's go back on that ride. Like, let's pull you back. There's on system. the side of efficiency, right? So that re- yes. thing with mold, yes. but I love that you're saying that because people don't realize, oh, if I'm not eliminating, I'm reabsorbing. Yes. And which is, and then, and then you think to yourself, gosh, why is my period so heavy? Why, why are my breasts so tender? Why am I having all these symptoms with my cycle, if you're still cycling, not realizing like, oh my gosh, my constipation's been really bad this month. Or, oh my gosh, I have hardly drank any water and my stress has been super high. And I have been, you know, around a lot of chemicals or not eating that great. And this makes sense because the estrogen that I had is not able to get out the body essentially in the route that it needs to go. So it's just hanging out, playing with its other estrogen friends. It's like a miracle round, round. Yes. Time we go. (laughs) Can't get off. Yeah. Love that. So talk real quickly about testing, you know, again, what's available for people? What can they ask for from anything from routine labs to specialty labs with you, which you and I prefer, what can we do with testing for women who are curious? So if you've never had any lab testing before ever, you've never had your hormones checked, please be aware that when, when Dr. Jill and I talk about testing your hormones, we are, we are a little more advanced or a lot more advanced, a little more functional. So when you, if you oftentimes you'll go to your doctor and say, I'd like my hormones checked, please. And they will go, great. Let's do a red blood cell and a white blood cell called a complete blood, uh, blood count CBC. Let's do a metabolic panel. Maybe throw your cholesterol in there. Cause it's been a while. And maybe, maybe if you're lucky, they'll run a TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone. And that's it. That's all their test. And yet here we are talking about estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and there's other, even other hormones we haven't talked about, DHEA and cortisol and insulin and right, all these hormones. So when you, when you go to get blood work done, if you've never had it and you need to start somewhere, that's where you get your pen out and you start making the list of all the things that you would like to have run. Now, it is really important when you are running the estrogen, estradiol, uh, progesterone, you do want it at a specific part of your cycle. Don't just run it you know, on Tuesday at two o'clock because that's convenient. You want to make sure you catch it in what's called the second half of your cycle, that luteal phase. Roughly, we say around day 19, 20, or 21, if you have a 28-ish day cycle. Menopausal women, if you're listening to this, you do not have to collect at a certain time. You, the same hormones still apply to you. Even being menopausal, I don't care. Um, but you can collect it any time because you don't have a cycle. Now, let's say you've done that or you are ready to go into the deeper next step, more functional. 
that's where Dr. Jill and I prefer or use other tests. Now we've been talking about estrogen detoxification and if budget is a big issue, what I prefer to start with actually when it comes to hormones is again, elimination. So I often will start with um, gut testing, GI testing, which is a very fancy word for poop testing. You will have to poop in a cup for science, which mortifies yes. a lot of people. <laughs> but I want to see what's going on because it's just like in your home, if the bathtub is overflowing and clogged, I want to know, is it because the actual water won't turn off? Is it because the drain is clogged? Is it because the sewer line is clogged? So we got to check your sewer line, which is obviously doing a little stool test. Yeah. And then we get into more that functional hormone look. Um, I used to work for the company called the Dutch test, which is the one that uh, Jill mentioned earlier. And the reason I like that one so much, um, even though I don't work for them anymore, um, but they give us a better insight into your, where does estrogen go? Looks so at all somebody, the pathways, It right? looks at all the pathways, a yeah. lot of the pathways. And that's really helpful. Male or female, doesn't matter. You know, it, um, men make hormones too, especially mm -hmm. estrogen. And so it helps us look at those pathways. Amazing. And thanks for that great overview. Cause that's always <laughs> the thing is what do I do? How do I test? And even the right. timing and everything is so important. So that's a great place to start. If you're curious, you're out there and many docs will run blood work, which is our first. Um, and I would say estradiol, progesterone, mm -hmm. DHEAS, testosterone, free and total cortisol in the morning. Um, those are the very, very basics. Anything else that you would recommend on a routine lab that they're looking for metabolic? <laughs> Well, I would definitely add in that thyroid. I would yes, thank you. Right, include right. So I would do the full, which I'm sure I know you've talked yeah. about before in other podcasts, but um just that say whole, it. TSH, free TSH, T3, yep. free T4, and uh thyroid antibodies as well. CD yes, antibodies. yes, yep, definitely. Perfect. And one of the you said metabolic health, one of the big yeah. ones that I find a lot of women um don't they they'll get glucose, but they won't get an insulin added. And as we get older, as we head into perimenopause and our hormone shift we become more insulin resistant, which is not a good thing. We don't want to become um, more insulin resistant. And so really ask your practitioner if you're getting blood work, like, hey, I'm getting a fasting glucose. Can you go ahead and add a fasting insulin on there? Because right. ideally you want a fasting insulin between two and five. Right. Now, when you get that range back, you're going to see it's going to say two to 25. Right. 25 is an absolute no-no. We want it two dash Five. Like it's a very narrow range and the research and the literature supports that two to five. The reason it's up to 25 is that the old, old, old range has not adjusted and caught up with the current literature out there. So this is a good place to say a lot of the ideals and function medicine, we want optimal, not just yeah. disease. So it's like, it's not like Tuesday, you wake up and you're not diabetic. And then Wednesday, next day, you're diabetic. There's no like crossover or line. It's a spectrum, this trajectory that we're all walking on. Yeah. So what you and I like to do is, okay, this might be the range of normal thyroid, but we're like, what's best, what's yeah. optimal, right? And there's yeah. a much more narrow function range that we often use for maybe TSH. I like it below three, mm -hmm. uh, of 3.3 to three is kind of my ideal. And if I'm treating sometimes below two, so yeah. I want to really optimize their thyroid, their TSH. Um, insulin, totally love that below yeah. five is ideal. Um, fasting blood sugar, I'd say below 90. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. I yeah. agree. Yep. Yep. Than, yep. What about hormones? Like, uh, so say someone is um, cycling in their luteal phase, they do it day in the 20 of their cycle. Mm -hmm. What kind of ratio between estrogen and progesterone would you like to see there? Is so there in a blood, in blood work now, again, these are American numbers. Yep. So if I'm sure if you, I apologize for those international who are listening, you'll have to do the conversion, but progesterone, we generally like it in the double digits. And so we want it 10 or higher. Now we, if you are like a three or a four or five, that means you did ovulate and you were eking out some progesterone. It's just not strong enough. So ideally we're looking at, you know, 10 or higher. Mm -hmm. And then again, that estradiol, that estradiol, we tend to look for it to be, some people say above a hundred, some people say above 150, mm -hmm. depending on, you know, your history, your age with what's going on with that. And okay. so, and, and the ratio, um, I, I generally don't, while I talk about a ratio is to how it's important, I don't generally do a ratio calculation only because um, when you get your blood drawn, there's two types of machines that will run a blood, blood work, immunoassay and a mass spec. And I know the, like this is, you're like, what? I do not care about this. I'm like, I know I get that. Mass spec though is more sensitive. And so, but it, that makes it a little more expensive. So ideally you don't want mismatch. Like you don't want your progesterone and an immunoassay and your estradiol on a mass spec or vice versa. You hopefully, when we get into the, to the like the weeds of testing, yeah. I'm hoping it's, I want the same machine, yeah. the same type of machine. And I want it to be 
mess spec because I it's the most sensitive, but I want the most sensitive for you um, because you don't feel good, right? Most people are like, I'm, I feel hormonal. Something's wrong. I'm like, right, let's, let's figure it out. Here, I love that you're saying this because what we're talking about is nanograms in incredibly tiny amounts. And this is actually why the endocrine disruptors are so fascinating because they act at this hormetic effect. And so just take, I'm going to go off on a slight tangent. I promise. Do it. Back. But with um, things that are endocrine disruptors, there's this biphasic curve. And what that means is that to, to, uh, classical toxicology says, okay, at this level, 50% of people are toxic. And so we say, okay, above that level, and I'm just randomly saying numbers, mm-hmm. it's not that above that level, it's toxic to most people. But what they miss is sometimes there's this hormetic effect at incredibly tiny levels in synergy when you add hormones together or not hormones, chemicals, when you add chemicals together. So at these incredibly low levels that are not considered toxic, it has an hormone-like or hormetic effect on the body at an extremely low level that again is not in the toxicology text. And then Mm -hmm. when you synergistically add those, they can have profound found disruptive effects because it's, it messes with that hormetic. And I say that because what we're measuring is incredibly tiny amounts. Yeah. In fact, I think for decades, you couldn't measure now we can, yeah. but because the, um, in the machinery wasn't accurate enough, right. To actually right. detect these low levels. So they're very small amounts, which yeah, is why the machinery matters. I love it. It does. And you know, what's so interesting too, is, and I'm sure it was very frustrating for you, given your history is that they will say, um, what's a good example bleach in tampons as an example, dioxin in tampons. And they'll say, well, you, you need Jill, you would need this much dioxin to be toxic. So one tampon with a tiny amount of dioxin in it to bleach it white is not a problem. Right. But you probably started your period right in, in, in your early teens. And then you get your period every single month, barring, you know, those listening who were, who were pregnant. So that's a lot of teeny tiny exposure over and 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 over again. And I've had so many women say to me, you know, when I switched from maybe a conventional tampon to more an organic non-bleach tampon, um, or then my symptoms got better. My cramps went down, you know, I, my endo, I mean, it doesn't, uh, cure it, but like, oh my gosh, my endo actually improved a little bit. Like the cramps were more bearable. And because they've been using the same tampon, since they were 12, 10, right. 9, right. 14, right. whatever it is. And we don't think about that. Our, yeah. uh, yes, a large dioxin dose is yeah. toxic. But what about when we have these teeny tiny little micro exposures all the time? I love that you're saying that. Or um, you mentioned just a little allude, allusion to these uh, forever chemicals. So the oh, latest yes. thing on the block, right, is these PFS, yes. which are Teflon and Gore-Tex materials. And they're in any sort of rain resistant or liquid resistant, like your mattress cover might have these or your furniture, if it's stain resistant or your carpets might have them. We can absorb these through the skin. And we know now in, here where I'm at in Colorado, every water supply has contamination levels. And now with the new threshold, they're all considered and they're forever. So the scientists, when they try to find the half-life, they can't even calculate the half-life of these PFAOs. And that's just one thing. I know it's like, oh, these are things forever in the environment. So these things do matter. And on a little existential tangent, our environment matters. I'm becoming much more environmentally conscious because the wildfires are affecting our air quality and the PFAOs are affecting our water supply. And so there's really, really lots of things that we have to start to take action. I'm like a non-political kind of person, but I realized I have to start to be more um, action oriented and encouraging others because these things are getting in our environment and affecting our hormones and our future generations are set up for, yeah, disaster if we're not careful. Right. I totally agree. I totally agree. And I know when you see big things like fire, because like like Colorado, Oregon, and Washington had a lot, historically are having a lot of fires, and um, you might watch the news or think to yourself or listening right now, oh, it's a fire. There's nothing I can do. When in fact, in your home, in your HVAC system yeah. or your air filters, there's actually or or supplements to support lung or you know uh, antioxidant, and there's a lot you can actually do to help not progress feeling unhealthy when you get these exposures. Yeah. Uh, and just a quick tidbit on wildfires, a, almost a year ago today, we had a massive wildfire in my community, lost a thousand homes, all that happened. It was literally in the middle of winter. Um, and I did not realize until that how massively that toxic air quality, it was worse than mold for many people. And I literally started seeing some lab values like TGF beta and random things that would typically signify other toxicity just from the wildfires. So even if you're like, oh, it's not affecting me, but you know that your air quality is down because there's a fire, you know, hundred miles away or 50 miles away, it really is affecting all of us. So sadly. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know why I didn't think of this as a 
grown, educated woman, but somebody said to me, well, Carrie, you think wildfire and you often think forest land. So woods, trees, what a soil, whatever, but they're like wildfires burn everything, cars, yeah. homes, plastic, buildings. Uh, and, and nowadays like, that's what we were thinking plastic, about here. Everything. Like your, uh, and nowadays the, the um, back, you know, porches or your benches in your yard, they're made of plastic a lot of times, or you have chemicals in your garage, like gasoline or Roundup or whatever, all these things, like you said, they burn and then they make a huge toxic right up to the load. air. Oh gosh. We need to live in a bubble. Somehow. I know, I know. <laughs> but a fun bubble. I want a fun bubble. Toxicity <laughs> is like, um, it can be pretty depressing. Mm-hmm. So we'll, try, we'll end up on some positive notes. So, okay. Say a woman gets hormones. They're kind of, um, let's talk about two, two things. First of all, the say 32 year old woman, maybe has had a couple kids, may or may not want to have more children, but is really struggling with the classical and estrogen dominance. Let's talk about her. What should she do? And then let's talk about the menopausal woman. Mm-hmm. I'm going there too. Like, <laughs> what do we do when the hormones do the roller coaster? So first of all, this, you know, 20, 30 something woman who's cycling, maybe struggling with infertility, maybe struggling breast tenderness. What do we do with this woman? What, how do they start besides elimination, yeah. which is what you mentioned first. And the, the really nice thing is, um, it's kind of the same suggestions for everything and everybody, Perfect. you know, right? Like all the things yeah, in your book, right. people, if, if you and I had a magic pill and, and we say this all the time, we would not, we would not gatekeep. We would give it to people. Yes. I would airdrop it across the world if we had a magic pill, <laughs> yes. but it goes back to, especially that 32 year old, if you're, you're cycling and you identify with what Dr. Jill just said, you know, is, is, is women, our brain is the big hub for do we, or do we not make hormones? And our brain is constantly like scanning our environment. Do we have enough food? Do we, you know, do we, is it too toxic? Is it too stressful? Have you not had enough sleep? Have you skipped time zones? You know, have you, have you, have you, if, 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 and, 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 and then what can happen if you check yes to all those boxes, it says, you know what, this is not a good month to ovulate. I'm not going to release an egg this month. And therefore your progesterone is going to be low and you're going to feel very estrogenic. So what we have found although it's sometimes hard to hear is taking evaluation of what's been going on the last couple months and course correcting. Have you been getting enough sleep? How has your stress been? Are you feeling happy, safe, and joyful? What does your nutrition look like? Have you had movement exercise? Um, are, you know, do you have joy in your life? Um, what do you experience nature? Do you, is it pitch black where you are because it's the winter? Do you get any sunlight at all? Or do you sit at your desk all day and, and completely miss out on the outside? And so as you're evaluating this, these basics, I kid you not, can be really helpful at getting you back on track. If you were on track and you got off track, these can help you get back on track. Of course, there are other um, instances such as maybe th- we need to look at your thyroid. Mm-hmm. Maybe nobody's ever diagnosed you or figured out that you have PCOS, right? There's definitely other stuff that could be going on metabolically or hormonally that we need to look at. As you're listening to this, or have you lit every candle in your house? And maybe you should evaluate that. You yeah. know? Maybe yeah. maybe as you've got the lavender detergent going in your dishwasher or in your, uh, in your washing machine and you've got the whatever scent, lemon scent all over your dishes and you've got your perfume on and your candles lit, maybe we should reevaluate that to, to really help. And then alcohol, you know? So as you're listening to this, baby steps, one thing at a time to really help get you back on track. Mm-hmm. Now for the menopausal woman, it's the same absolute things apply. I don't know. I'm sure you might agree, but I tend to find the women that go through menopause easier have done an audit of those things. Yes. They're focusing on their sleep. They're focusing on their joy, their happiness, their safety. They are focusing on their nutrition, their movement, their exercise, um, their community, um, their blood sugar, et cetera. And menopause tends to be easier for them. Now, could they still have thyroid issues? Yes. Could they still need to go on hormone replacement therapy? Absolutely. Yes. But hormone replacement therapy is not going to solve the fact that you, um, choose to stay up late at night. You're always on your phone or tablet. You, you know, live on potato chips and bagels and coffee and energy drinks. You haven't seen outside in months because it's dark and cold outside. Hormone replacement therapy is just not going to save that. So you do have to get back to the basics and then we add in and support the other stuff, um, for the menopausal woman as well. Love that because it's so (laughs) hard to go back to the, you know, we forget we can. And honestly, I always say hormones are like sledgehammers. They're very powerful and they're appropriate for sometimes, but you don't want to start with a sledgehammer. You start with like a little tool that's 
precise, like the sleep and the air and the water and all those things. So love that. We didn't talk a lot, but before we, you know, end, I want to talk a little bit about cortisol and stress because that oh, plays yeah. into this massively too, right? Yeah. What happens when we are either under massive stress and have really high cortisol or when that starts to deplete and we're like, I have been the last year, much more <laughs> flat line cortisol. <laughs> um, tell us about those two scenarios and how that affects the hormones or just the, the body in general as well, the cortisol curves. Yeah. So actually what I will say is that cortisol gets villainized just like estrogen gets villainized. Yeah. Now we've talked to, I, sh we sh I should have said this in the beginning. I apologize. Estrogen, she's not bad. Like we right. need her for our heart and our brain and our skin and our joints. <laughs> our vagina likes estrogen. We, we need our estrogen. It's just out of balance, out of ratio where she becomes dramatic and says, this isn't working for me. I'm going to cause symptoms. So uh, I do hear that a lot of like, oh, I wish I don't have any estrogen. I'm like, no, trust me. That's not true because your poor brain, your poor heart, your poor joints, et cetera. Cortisol is the same way. We have cortisol for a reason. People villainize it. Oh, I hate cortisol because it, it makes me put on weight around the middle. It makes me puffy. I'm like, well, it's elevated for a reason. So cortisol is one of our stress hormones that helps us. It goes up to protect us. It goes up to change systems in our body so that we can fight or flight or freeze. If there is a threat um, around us, a tiger, a lion, a bear. The problem is, of course, a lot of our threats are over text or a lot of our threats are um, that we live with or we work with or, <laughs> or in front of our computer and they're not actually a, a tiger, a lion or a bear. And they happen every day and they're small threats and they're big threats. So it's a lot of stress, little stresses that happen all day long. So you ask your partner, how was your day? And they go, oh my gosh, it's never ending. My day was never ending. I had this meeting, that meeting, this fight, that fight, that I got this email and everything's little, but it all adds up. Or maybe you had one big stress, you know, you know, you know, God forbid you had a car accident or going through a divorce or even good, good stresses. I'm putting air quotes for those who can't yeah. see me. Babies, new babies, right? New babies are very stressful but you probably wanted it. So it's like a good stress. Weddings, you probably hopefully wanted to get married. Weddings are stressful. So cortisol affects our blood sugar. Cortisol affects our immune system. Cortisol affects our inflammation and hundred percent cortisol talks to, communicates and plays with our hormones, all of them. In fact, your whole body talks as a unit. Right. There's nobody is siloed. Nobody's individual or independent. Everybody's extroverted and everybody talks to each other. So when it comes to cortisol, we want it elevated in the morning within reason, there is a range and it drops down at night. So cortisol is like your sun comes out in the day. And then at night you want melatonin to come out. Melatonin is like your moon. If you have a flipped curve, you tend to be tired in the morning and wired at night. You get that second wind and you can't fall asleep. Or maybe you crash in the afternoon. You do okay in the morning, but then you crash in the afternoon. Or maybe your cortisol is way too high in, in the morning so you go right into stress, anxiety, panic, and you can't come down. Mm -hmm. What happens over time is that we have what's called a negative feedback loop. So you had high cortisol, high cortisol, high cortisol, and the brain goes, yeah, this is annoying. I don't like this. I'm going to slow down production of cortisol. And then you drop, 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 drop down until you get low cortisol production. And now you generally feel kind of wiped out, burned out, tired. All the time. So when I see low cortisol in people, I usually ask them, Hey, what's been going on the last three months to a year or more? Because I bet you had high cortisol and this is the end result. It's sort of burning out, if you will. Yeah. Like case in point, when you, um, some people try to do a documentary and a book all in one year. <laughs> some people wonder who that some could be. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I, I totally get it. And then get mold exposure and anyway, right. totally get it. Oh, Carrie, you things. are so fun to talk to, so full of great analogies and great, um, even just listening to the sun and moon, and you're so good at making this just very applicable to the listener. It's always such a pleasure. Um, tell, let's leave with one takeaway. What would you give the listener who's maybe struggling with hormones? We've talked about a lot. What's your yep. takeaway? I'll be honest. It's not, it's, you're going to, everyone's going to laugh. I actually have it written on the board behind me. It says healing happens at joy. That is not my quote. I feel, I honestly forget. I feel terrible. I can't remember whose, whose uh, quote it is. Um, but she was talking about different levels of emotion, whereas like anger and fear, um, are at the bottom of an emotional you know, list. And then as you move up, joy is where true healing starts to happen. And when we talk about stress, we talk about stress. I tell people to find joy, to find your joy. When you find a little joy, whether it's 
the funny memes your friend sends you or the cute little thing your cat just did or that funny TV show you watch for 30 minutes to check out. It doesn't have to be big joy all day long, but it's the little joys. That's where we start to lower our cortisol. That's where we start to feel safe. When we can find our joy, that basic, that base can really be helpful for our hormones, for our sleep, right? For our cortisol. And so that's the, that's the sort of easy takeaway that I like to tell people is, do you have joy in your life? And if you don't, let's start finding it in the little ways every single day so that it can add up to a big way. I love that. Love that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, thank you again. And I know you're with Rupa now. Do you want to just say a little plug for Rupa and tell us where else yes. we can find you? Yes. So Rupa Health, for those practitioners who are listening, is the one-stop shopping lab portal. So if you are listening to us today and we're talking about um, you know, blood work labs or urine labs or saliva labs or mold labs or uh, stool labs. And instead of having to go in and out of multiple portals to order it, you can create one portal on Rupa and then order all of those labs for your patients. So it's very, very easy to organize. And, and then as far as Antonio, really quick, we, I, yes. love, I love Rupa. We, our PA who came and worked with me was like, oh, we use Rupa. And I just like, what's Rupa? And <laughs> it changed our life at the office. So it. thank you. Then you yes. tell me about you, Carrie. Where yes. You? Um, I am on Instagram quite a bit. So I am at dr.carriejones and my website is www.drcarriejones. And I'm dipping my baby toe into TikTok, which is very scary, trying to get more videos out there to, yeah. although everybody's on TikTok now, it used to be quote the younger generation, but just to, for hormone education and um, to have a lot more fun uh, around hormones and, you know, female health. So, um, but again, at Dr. Carrie Jones. And if anyone's fun, it's you. Like I, said, <laughs> I, I love your sense of humor. So Carrie, thank you so much. It's been so fun to talk to you today. Oh, Dr. Jell, I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome.